Stave 3, the second of the three spirits. Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was upon again the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time for the especial purpose of holding a conference with a second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But, finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new specter would draw back, he pulled every one of them aside with his own hands and, lying down again, established a sharp lookout all around the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two, and being usually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter, between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite as a bit as heartily as this, I don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently, when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, the very core and center of a blaze of ruddy light, which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant, or what it would be at, and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at that very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion, without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, he began to think, as you or I would have thought at first, for it is always the person not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it, and would unquestionably have done it too. At last, I say, he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence, on further tracing it, it seemed to shine. This idea taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room, there was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light, as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a heath had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, lawn wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see who bore such a glowing torch in a shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high, high up, to shed its light upon Scrooge as he came peeping round the corner. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and through the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe or mantle, bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capricious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. 
Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holly wreath set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanor, and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. "'You have never seen the like of me before!' exclaimed the spirit. "'Never,' Scrooge made answer to it. "'Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born in these later years,' perused the phantom. "'I do not think I have,' said Scrooge. "'I am afraid I have not. Have you many brothers, spirit?' "'More than eighteen hundred, said the ghost. "'A tremendous family to provide for,' muttered Scrooge. "'The ghost of Christmas present rose. "'Spirit,' said Scrooge submissively, "'conduct me where you will. "'I went forth last night on compulsion, "'and I learned a lesson which is working now. "'Tonight, if you have aught teach me, "'let me profit by it. "'Touch my robe!' "'Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. "'Holly.' Mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit, and punch all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of the night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses, whence it was a mad delight to the boys to see it come plumping down onto the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been plowed up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times, where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace in the yellow, thick mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked up with a dingy mass, mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad in that clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavored to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, and now and then exchanging a facetious snowball, better natured missile that far than many a wordy jest, laughing heartily as if it went right and not less heartily if it went wrong. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great round pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the streets in their popoliptic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions, shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars, and winking from their shelves in wanton slyness at girls as they went by and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from com conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were no folk biffins, squab, swarthy, setting off the yellow oranges and lemons, and, in great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. 
The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant-blooded race, appeared to know that there was something going on, and, to a fish, went gasping around in their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers! Oh, the grocers! Nearly closed, with perhaps two shutters down, or one, but through those gaps such glimpses. It was not alone that the scales descended on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candy fruit so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest onlookers feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress, but the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the hope and promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing their wicker baskets wildly and left their purchases upon the counter and came running back to fetch them and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humor possible, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own worn outside for general inspection and for Christmas daws to peck at if they chose. But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces. And at the same time there emerged from the scores of by streets, lanes, and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood, with Scrooge behind him, in a baker's doorway, and, taking off the covers as their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on the dinners from his torch. And it was very, uh, and it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor was restored directly. For, they said, it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, and so it was. God love it, so it was. In time the bells ceased and the bakers were shut up, and yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all the, these dinners and the progress of their cooking in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven where the pavement smoked as if its stones were cooking too. Is there a peculiar flavor in which you sprinkle from your torch? asked Scrooge. There is my own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? asked Scrooge. To any kindly given, to a poor one most. Why to a poor one most? asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge after a moment's thought. I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I cried the spirit. You would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day on which it can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge. Wouldn't you? I cried the spirit. You seek to close these places on seventh day, said Scrooge. And it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I am wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who claim to know us and do deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that, and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on, invisible, as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. 
It was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possible he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure of the good spirit had in showing off his power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all the poor men that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled, and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with sprinklings of his torch. Think of that! Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. She laid the call cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth and rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that the outside of the bakers had smelled the goose and had known it for their own, and, basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes, bubbling up, knocked loudly on the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim. And Martha wasn't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said a girl, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's Martha, mother,' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are,' said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet with officious zeal. "'We'd a deal of work to finish up last night,' replied the girl, "'and had to clear away this morning, mother.' "'Well, never mind, as long as you are come,' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless ye.' "'No, no, father's coming!' cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. "'Hide, Martha, hide!' So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. "'Why, where's our Martha?' cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. "'Not coming,' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Not coming?' said Bob, with a sudden declension from his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. "'Not coming upon Christmas Day?' Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only a joke, so she came out prematurely from hiding behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. "'And how did little Tiny Tim behave?' asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob hugged his daughter to his heart's content. "'As good as gold,' said Bob, "'and better.' Somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and he thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and they came back. And back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, 
compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they had returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought the goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot, Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table, and the two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed the spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for the goose before their turn to come had helped. At last the dishes were set upon, and grace was said. It was succeeded by breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all on the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight rose all around the board. And even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife, and feebly cried, Hurrah! There was never such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone on the dish, they hadn't ate at all at last. Yet everyone had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were seeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in the turning out. Suppose somebody should have gotten over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. There was the cloth. A smell like a eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with a laundress next door to that. There was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half a quatern of ignited brandy and bedlight, with Christmas holly stuck in the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Miss Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that, now that the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for such a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovelful of chestnuts in the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half of one, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dear. God bless us. Which the, all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his if, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. 
I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit, say that he'll be spared. If these shadows remained unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. O oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke, and, trembling, cast his eyes upon the ground. But he raised them speedily upon hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children. It's Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer. Christmas Day. I'll drink to his health for your sake in the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank last of all, but he didn't care twopence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family and the mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party which was not spelled for a full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, and from the mere relief of Scrooge the Baleful being done with, Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, a full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor for when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, then told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home, and how she had seen a countless and lord come days before, and how the lord was about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts in the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice, and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family, and they were not well dressed, and their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time, and when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge's eye hat was upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. By this time it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets. The brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlors, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. 
Here the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cozy dinner, with hot plates baking through and through before the fire, and the deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out the cold and darkness. There, all the children of the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, and be the first to greet them. Here again were shadows on the window blinds of guests assembling, and there a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted, and chattering all at once, topped off lightly to some neighbor's house, where, woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches, well they knew it, in a glow. But, if you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there, instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fires half chimney high. Blessings on it how the ghost exalted, how it bared its breadth of breast and opened its capricious palm, and floated on, outpouring with generous hand its bright and harmless mirth on everything within reach. The very lamplighter who ran on before, dotting the dusty street with specks of light, and who dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as the spirit passed, though little kenned the lamplighter that he had any company but Christmas. And now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor, where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about, as though it were a burial place of giants and water spread itself wherever it listed, or would have done so, but for the frost that held it prisoner, and nothing grew but marth, moss and furs, and coarse rank grass. Down in the west the setting sun left a streak of fiery red which glared upon the desolation for an instant like a sullen eye, and frowning lower, lower, lower yet, was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. What place is this? asked Scrooge. A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth, returned the spirit. But they know me. See? A light shone from a window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced towards it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman, with their children and their children's children, and another generation beyond that, all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy. From time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his vigor sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge to hold his robe, and, passing out above the moor, sped whither? Not to see. To see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind them, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns it had worn, and fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rock some leagues or so from shore, upon which waters chafed and dashed the wild through the year, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seedweed clung to its base, and the storm birds, born of the wind one might suppose, as seaweed of the water, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. But even here, two men who watched the light had made a fire, and through a loophole in a thick stone wall shed a ray of brightness on the awful sea. Judging from their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat, they witched each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the elder too, with his face all damaged and scarred with hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be, struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale in itself. Again the ghost sped on, above the black and heaving sea, on, on, until, being far away, as he told Scrooge, from any shore, they lighted upon a ship. They stood behind the helmsman at the wheel, the lookout at the bow, the officers who had the watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. But every man among them hummed a Christmas tune, or had a Christmas thought, or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day,
with homeward hopes belonging to it. And every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had a kinder word from one another on that day in the year, and they shared to some extent in its festivities, and had remembered those he had cared for at a distance, and had known that they had delighted to remember him. It was great surprise to Scrooge while listening to the moaning of the wind and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. And it was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at the same nephew with approving affability. Ha ha! laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha ha ha! If you should happen, by any unlikely chance, to know a man more blessed and laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is, I should like to know him too. Introduce him to me, and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is a fair, even-handed, and noble adjustment of things that, while there is an infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in his way, holding his side, rolling his head, twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, not being a bit behind, roared out lustily. Ha 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 ha! He said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too. More shame for him, friend, said Scrooge's niece in dignity. Bless those women, they never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed to be made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she is what you would call provoking, you know, but satisfactory, too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he's very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's niece. At least you tell me so. What of it, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking <laughs> that he's ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, as always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else had said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they had all just had dinner, and, with the dessert on the table, were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear, said Scrooge's nephew. But I haven't got any faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereat, Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one in the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. Do go on, Fred, Scrooge's niece clapping her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. Such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh, and it was impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromatic vinegar. His example was unanimously followed. I was only going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, 
that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses pleasanter company than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him. If he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to look at his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's something, and I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge, but being thoroughly good-natured and not much caring what they laughed at, so they laughed at any rate, and he encouraged them in their merriment, and passed the bottle joyously. After tea, they had some music, for they were a musical family and knew what they were about when they sung a glee or catch. I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one and never swell the large veins in his forehead, or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played, among other tunes, a simple little air, a mere nothing, you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who had fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been reminded of the ghost of Christmas past. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that the ghost had shown him come upon his mind. He softened more and more at the thought of it. If he could have listened to it often years ago, he might have cultivated the kindness of life for his own happiness with his own hands, without resorting to the sextant spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better at Christmas. When its mighty founder was a child, it's himself. Stop! There was first a game of blind man's bluff. Of course there was. And I no more believe Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew and the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister and the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over chairs, bumping up against the piano, and smothering himself in the curtains, wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, on purpose, he wouldn't have made a feint of endeavoring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried that it wasn't fair, and it really was not, but when at last he caught her, when, in spite of all her silken rustlings and her rapid flutterings past him, he got her in the corner whence there was no escape, then his conduct was most excarable. For his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress, and to further assure himself of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger and a certain chain about her neck, was vile and monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it, when, another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind men's bluff party, but was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner, where the ghost and Scrooge were together behind her. But she joined in the forfeits and loved her admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great, and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew, beat her sisters hollow, though they were sharp girls too, as Topper could have told you. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for, wholly forgetting, in the interest he had in what was going on, that his voice made no sound in their ears. He sometimes came out with his guest quite loud, and very often guessed right, too, for the sharpest needle, the best white chapel, warranted not to cut in the eye, but was sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favor that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guest departed. But the spirit said this could not be done. 
Here's a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour, Spirit. Only one. The game was called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must figure out, with him only answering yes or no as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal. A live animal, rather than a disagreeable animal. A savage animal. An animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, didn't live in a menagerie, it was never killed in a market, was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst in a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressly tickled that he was obliged to get, off off, get up off the sofa and stamp. At last the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge. Which it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment, although some objected to the reply, Is it a bear? ought to have been yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts away from Mr. Scrooge, supposing that they ever had any tendency in that way. It's given pl us plenty of merriment, I'm sure, said F Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink to his health. Here's a glass of mulled wine, ready to our hand at the moment, and I say Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, wherever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it nonetheless. Uncle Scrooge! Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return, and thanked them in an aud inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in a breath as the last word was spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. On foreign lands, and they were close by home. By struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope. By poverty, and it was rich. In an alum's house, hospital, and jail. In misery's every refuge, where vain men in his little brief authority had not made fast the door, and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing, and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this, because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into a space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it, until they left a children's twelfth night party, when, looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed their hair was gray. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight? cried Scrooge. Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at the moment. Forgive me if I'm not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. But I see something strange and not belonging to yourself, protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, because there is flesh upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of its robe he brought two children, wretched abject, frightful, hideous, and miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of the garment. Oh, man, look here, look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate, too, in their humility where graceful use should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, 
A stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them, pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat and thrown, devils lurked and glaring out and menacing. No change, no degradation, no preservation of humanity in any grade, though all the mysteries of wonderful creations has monsters so half and terrible and dread. Scrooge started back, appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say they were fine children, but the words choked themselves rather than be parties to lies of such enormous magnitude. Spirit! Are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them. And they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy, ignorance. This girl is want. Beware of them both, and all of their degree. But most of all, beware the boy. For on his brow I see written which is doom unless the writing be erased. Deny it, cried the spirit, stretching out its hand toward the city. Slander those who tell it ye. Admit it for your facetious purpose and make it worse, and bid the end. Have they no refuge or resource, cried Scrooge? Are there no prisons, said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and, lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him.